evening and welcome to our Cyber Sanctuary. I am Elder Mark Wilson and we will be doing our virtual Bible study on this evening. Please join me in a quick word of prayer and we're going to jump right into the word of God. Father, we give you glory, honor, and praise for this moment in time, God, that we have to dive, to dig into your word. Father, we pray right now for accuracy, God. We pray for revelation. We pray for understanding, God. We pray for your Holy Spirit to fill us now, God, that we might be able to hear what you are saying to the church, Father. Make us invisible, Father God, that you have your perfect way in this study on tonight, God. God, we Bind up the enemy and every spirit that will come to destroy, distract, to kill, and to steal. And Father God, we give you and your Holy Spirit legal authority to rule and to rest in this Bible study. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. All right. Welcome, everybody. I'm very excited to be with you all again on this evening. And we've been talking about prayer for the last month. And I'm excited to be able to just dive into just some more prayer tonight. You can see our title that was on the screen. It is What's Hindering My Prayer? What's hindering my prayer? We have so many of us are in just different places with God from um, from an unsaved point to children to uh, being advanced in his word to knowing the Bible. But what are those things that, that can stop my prayer? What are those things that can cause my prayers to go unheard or go unanswered? And so let's talk about that tonight. Let's look at James chapter number four. We're going to look at verse number three. I'm going to just for our beginning as we start, I'm just going to pick out this scripture. You guys, if, if you have been uh, listening uh, over the past, I usually don't like to pick out a single verse, but we're going to pick out that scripture for now to get us started. And we're going to jump right back in and we're going to x-ray the information around it, even in uh, chapter number three. All right. So verse number three, James chapter four, verse number three says this, you ask and receive not. Because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. And so as we know, there's a lot more that James, the writer of this book, is talking about before. And he's talking about a lot afterwards that go along with this particular verse. But we're going to answer our question tonight first. All right. Our question is in our title. What's hindering my prayer? Boom. There it is. All right. We ask amiss. All right. We ask amiss that we might be able to consume it upon our lust or our pleasures. All right. And so I had to go in and I had to define this word amiss because I what are we talking about here? What is this amiss thing? And so when you go in and you define that word, not just uh, in Webster's, but when you go back and look at this in the Greek, it is the word kakos. All right. Amiss means kakos. That means this was very, very interesting to me, and as our bishop says, this floored me. Uh, but this really caught my attention. It says evil, to be miserable, but it also says to be diseased, or sick, or sore. All right, and you can look that word up, kakos, the word amiss. It means diseased, evil, or miserable. All right, and so now it, it makes me think back to when you're sick, right? Whenever you're sick, and I'm not talking about you got a little sniffle, I'm talking about you sick, right? You're down. All right, but notice how you can't accomplish the most easy of tasks sometimes when you're sick, right? Some of the things that you do routinely are very difficult to accomplish when you are sick, right? You might try to go into work, get yourself to, if you can make it to work, all right? People, they'll send you home, right? They'll say, you get out of here. We don't want you to make anybody else sick. But they'll also tell you to go to the doctor, right? You need to go get checked out. You need somebody to look at you, all right? Because you're not well. All right, and so this let's let's put that let's infuse that into that verse. All right, we're asking, we're receiving, uh, we receive not because we ask while we're sick. All right, because we're sick, and we're gonna we're gonna dive into this thing. All right, so then now you imagine you're sick, you're down, whatever it is, and you say, you know what, I'm gonna do just that. I'm gonna take that advice. I'm gonna go to the doctor's office. Right? You go into that doctor's office and you go into the doctor's office and you say, Doc, hey, I'm feeling terrible. Hey, I can't do anything. I got a fever, whatever the case is. I'm down. I got no energy. And then you come into him and you say, hey, Doc, 
I need a million dollars, man, because I am, I am down. You know what, Doc? I need a brand new house. I, doc, you know what? Give me a car also. That doctor might look at you like you are crazy. All right? Can you imagine how perplexed he would be? He would might he might think about right, what's going on with your priorities that you've come into my office, all right? Because you're sick and you're asking for material things. He might say, you know what? These things can't help you in this situation. I'm going somewhere with this. All right? I believe now when we take this to God. Right. When we talk about our prayer time. Right. Some of us are dealing with the sickness of sin. All right. And I believe that this uh, sometimes this can anger God, our father. This may perplex our father because we're there asking for things that, that's not going to help us with our present sickness. I got a witness out there somewhere. Some of us are struggling with sin, with unforgiveness, with the things that are literally making us sick, our soul and our spirit sick, yet we come to him asking for things. All right? And not that the things are wrong, but there must be a priority. There's a priority issue. And not to say when you go into the doctor's office that you don't need those things, but the reason why you're in the doctor's office is to get healthy first right because if you, you if you're sick unto death right and you die of this particular sickness what good would that be all right if you can't live to enjoy that new house that new car or those things that you asked for all right so now i think this is what sometimes can act, can cause us to pray amiss because we want to consume these things on our lusts all right now, I love this thing because when we look back at James here, he isn't just a chap. You know how the Bible is. Man has put the chapter numbers in there, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there was a stoppage of thought from one chapter to the next. All right. So in other words, we're going to look at some pieces in uh, James chapter three and see how he walks right into this statement about asking a mix, a miss. OK. Now, all right, so he, he lists several of these sicknesses, all right, and these things that hinder our prayer in chapter number three, all right? Now, the first thing that we're going to deal with, all right, if you're taking notes, start right here. The first sickness that we have to deal with, right, that asking a mess, right? All right, we're going to talk about a tongue sickness, all right, a tongue sickness. Follow me on over. Maybe one page back to James chapter number three. We're going to go to verse number six. All right. All right. You should be there. All right. Turn one page. All right. James chapter three, verse number six. All right. It says this. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body right and i'm going to submit that word defile when you look it up it's to stain or to spot but also we're going to use that sickness right that sickness can defile your body and that sin can be a defiling of our soul and of our spirit all right so that tongue it defiles the whole body all right and it sets on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire of hell. Verse number seven, for every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things of the sea is tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Therewith we bless God. Here we go. This is our operative verse. All right. This is us. All right. This is, this is us. All right. Out of the same, I'm sorry. Therewith we bless God. Even, look, he made it specific, even the Father, all right, and therewith, with the same tongue, curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. And, other, and also, God created man, God loves man, and we curse the very thing that God loves, all right? Now, verse number 10, out of the same mouth, right, proceed blessings and cursings. Verse number 10. My brother, it says these things ought not to be so. All right, does a fountain send forth 
at the same place sweet water and bitter water? Can a fig tree produce olive berries? All right. Can a vine produce figs? All right. So these things, they cannot be. Jesus even talks about it uh, in the book of Matthew when he talks about those um, new wine into old wineskins. That we have to make this change. We can't have sin and righteousness. All right. Both of them indwelling our temple. All right. So we have to deal with the sickness of our tongue. All right, at work, we talking bad about people. We, we, we cursing folk out. We doing whatever. And then we use that same tongue to come into the house of God and to worship his name and to pray and to ask for things. And he's saying, look, you have a sickness that we have to deal with. Look, I, he's a good father. He knows how to give good things as he told us in his word. But there's some things we have to deal with first before we get there. All right. We have to seek him for the medicine that we need. All right. We don't. Here's a reason why we don't. All right. This is a sidebar and I know it's a sidebar. All right. We don't because if we be honest, let's be honest. We think that money will make us happier than God can. All right. If we want to look, we would rather treat people bad we'll rather we'll rather have riches we'll have rather have money we'll rather have all these things and we don't think all right we don't think that god will bring us peace all right we don't believe that god can bring us peace when we look at this thing we'll do anything to be rich we'll do anything we'll treat anybody any old kind of way to get the things right that will that we can consume upon our lust and a lot of times Money is at the top of that list. As we know in another place, the word talks about how that money being the root of all evil. Right? And we'll do anything. We'll bad talk people to get riches, to, to, to do whatever, to get that promotion, to get whatever we see in life. All right? And we're in the pursuit of money and things. Okay? And we'll rather pursue after those things. We'll rather pursue after the American dream. Right? Then... Letting God fix our soul, giving us the medicine that our soul needs. So when we come before him, we don't ask God, help me with this. I'm struggling with forgiveness. I'm struggling with bitterness. I'm struggling with envy and strife. We don't come before him asking for those things. We come before him asking for the tangible things. All right. And there has to be a reversal of these things. All right. Now, look, even the world tells us, look. <laughs> and as we talk about this thing, pursuit of riches and pleasures and lust, all right, even the world tells us that those things are a lie. We, we know songs that, you know, I used to be out there, I used to listen to, to rap and all those type of things. But even there, we heard songs that would tell us the more money, more problems. We look at people um, like Michael Jackson, one of the most, um, <laughs> the biggest icons of our time, who struggled with just being able to sleep. A man with no peace. All right. We look at people like Robin Williams, you know, a adored celebrity, one of the funniest men of our time who committed suicide. All right. We also have shows in our society that says the lottery ruined my life. If that's not the biggest thing, if that's not the biggest oh, <laughs> wake up call. All right. The lottery. Every, all of us, we, we want to pursue these things and money because guess what? When we get the money, we can buy all the things, right? We're pursuing all these things and money, but yet we have shows out there of countless people that won the lottery millions and millions of dollars and it ruined the fabric of their life. All right? Now, put this in your spirit. Money can bring fun, but it cannot bring peace. Somebody need to tuck that in their spirit because we're chasing after some things. We're chasing after some money. All right? Money can bring fun. It can solve some things in your life, but one thing that it cannot bring is peace. All right? That is the job of God. All right? Now, here's the next sickness that we have to deal with. All right? We dealt with this tongue sickness. All right? We talked about this thing, how this we can't have these good and the evil coming from this same tongue. All right? Can't have the good and bad coming from this same tongue. We're gonna we're gonna gonna come back and visit that. All right, but now in the beginning of chapter number four, he begins to talk about some more things. Let's look at this thing. Chapter four, skip on down a little bit, verse number one and two. All right, 
verse number one and two. It says, from whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts, that war in your members? And so this fighting that he's talking about, he's not necessarily talking about us, us fighting. It can result in us fighting amongst each other, fighting with each other. But he says, look, it comes from the lust that's even at war in your members on the inside. We're going to talk about these members in a moment. All right. You lust and you have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you have not because you ask not. All right. Now, here's a simple revelation that God shared with me in the midst of this thing. As I'm looking at this thing. There are only fights, there are only wars, there are only struggles when two entities want different things. All right, very simple, but this thing is very powerful. There are only fights, and I'm talking about within you. I'm not talking, and also when you're talking about you're fighting against people, right? You only fight against that person because y'all want two different things, have two different agendas, right? That struggle, that war, when we have struggle in our lives, it's because we want two different things. Two different things, all right? Let that resonate in your spirit. Two different things, two or more different things, all right? <laughs> and sometimes that inner struggle, because look, my spirit wants God. It wants righteousness. It wants, uh, like I said, that spirit is always willing, right? But that flesh is weak. Look, my mind wants to be um, wants to be smart. It wants to be acknowledged. It wants to be ambitious, right? It wants to be praised. My soul wants to feel good. It wants to have pleasures. Uh, my emotions they they want to have revenge. They want to hurt somebody. They want, and so we have all all of the different parts of who we are. The members. We're not talking about hands and feet. Now we're talking about our soul, our spirit, our mind, our emotions. All of those members within us do exactly what is said in verse number one. All right. The war that's in our members. Right. My spirit is saying, you know what? I need to forgive them. Let it go. I got to love on them. Pray for my enemies. Right. That's been tucked in my spirit. But my flesh is like, you know what? <laughs> I will slash every tie that you own. All right. So now this is when we have the issue right there. We're fighting back and forth. We're trying to get somebody's advice. We're asked, hey, what do you think I should do in this situation? Look, some part, look, slash your tires. Look, I, what I would do, I would go doing this to them. And so God has given us direction and we find a way to go other directions. All right. And we have this pool for so many different directions. All right. And we're going to move over we're still going to be here in james all right i'm going to make a quick reference for second corinthians all right for second corinthians a very 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 familiar piece of scripture but we're going to dive into this thing and just take away some of the myths that we that are in our mind when we hear it all right you all know this second corinthians 10 3 through 5 it says for though we walk in the flesh we do not war we do not war after the flesh we're talking about a war here for the weapons peep this i'm gonna read it really slowly for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through god to the pulling down of strongholds sounds good right god's giving me the power i can tear down these strongholds i have all this power right sounds good right Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of god and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of christ right sounds good right god has given us this power with the word of god <laughs> now i want to and, and i will be perfectly honest for years i never looked at this scripture the way that i'm about to uh have us all look at this thing all right this is a scripture that is fully about destroying the war inside of you I know when I used to hear that, you know, God's word, you know, put out strongholds and people going through it. You know, we can use God's word, but let's turn that around. This is about the inner war, like we talked about here in James, the inner war that's in me. His word is strong enough to pull down strongholds in me, by me. Okay? All right? Casting down imaginations. You can't cast down imaginations in nobody but who? <laughs> this is good to me. 
in yourself, in your own mind. You can't cast down nobody else's imaginations, the images, right? And it says, bring it, this is what I love. This is the most powerful three words of this scripture. Bringing into captivity every thought, right? Whose thoughts can you captivate? Your own, my own, right? <laughs> I can only captivate my own thoughts and allow the word to bring the thoughts of my emotions, of my intellect, of my mind, of my flesh, of all these things. It has to captivate all of those thoughts and bring it under the subjection and the obedience of Jesus Christ. So that I have one mind and one thought. I don't have to struggle with, hey, should I do this? Should I slash the tries? I do what the word tells me because I take all those thoughts into captivity and I make it do what the word is telling me to do. This is the power of our weaponry. All right. This is saying, look, let's go back for the weapons of our warfare. It's that's in parentheses. It's telling you, look. You have some weapons within you that's so powerful, Jesus, it's so powerful that it can pull down your strongholds. It can pull down the tongue sickness that you have. It can pull down the war that's on the inside of you because it can make everything obey what the word is telling us to do. All right. And we said that, man, the devil made me do it. And I, I couldn't help it. But my friend, everybody else was doing it. There is no excuse because you have weaponry that's stronger than any device that the enemy has ever sent against you. All right. It, remind, it reminds me of ski shooting. All right. It reminds me of ski shooting in this. All right, y'all remember, you know, if you think about skeet shooting, you have that guy, they put clay discs, they shoot clay discs in the air, and that guy has his rifle, and as soon as he hits the air, boom, he shoots it down, right? Another one comes up, boom, he shoots it down. And so the same thing with your spirit. Your spirit, the word of God, the sword, your weapon, if you will, is strong enough that soon as that thing goes up in the air, boom, you can shoot it down. But you know what that reminds me of? All right, now this is for like my 45 and younger crowd, all right? If you're older than this, uh, please forgive me. You might not know what I'm talking about. But how many of y'all remember Duck Hunt? Right? How many of y'all remember Duck Hunt? Remember it had a skeet shooting, right? It had the ducks that flew out or it had the clay disc that came out. And so, how many of y'all remember those discs used to come out? You used to shoot at that duck. It would go all kind of places. It would go fast. But what did you used to do? Look, you used to go up close to the TV and as soon as the duck came out, as soon as that clay came out, boom, you would shoot it right there on the TV. Alright? That's the power of this thing. God is saying, look, you can, you got some weaponry strong enough to shoot these things down instantaneously. Look, and that duck cut, as soon as that duck would come up over the grass, boom, you would shoot that thing down. I got some witnesses in here that's like 45 and under. All right, but but for my, for my older generation and for my younger generation, it's just like that skeet shooting. If you don't know about skeet shooting, my younger generation, please go Google it, all right? But you guys got a visual of what we're talking about, okay? All right, now. So, God allows us to get close to take down, with this weaponry we have, we can take down any thought that rises against the Word of God. Alright, here's uh, my last point. Alright, there is an obedience issue. Alright, there's an obedience sickness that we have to deal with. Alright, let's go back to James. Alright, we're going back to James. We're going to verse number, we're going to chapter 3. Alright, we're going to verse 3 and 4. Alright. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm or steering wheel, whithersoever the governor listeth. In other words, wherever I turn that wheel, right, that ship is going to go. All right. Now, this thing is so powerful. I want you guys to imagine you're driving down the highway uh, for my drivers. All right. You're on the highway. You're going 65 miles an hour. All right. And your vehicle has a computer malfunction. All right. And each function that you have does the wrong thing. Right. You hit the brakes and the car goes faster. Right. You hit the gas and it stops. You turn the wheel to the right. And it, the car turns to the left. You turn it to the left and it turns to the right. You hit the AC and the heat comes on. You hit the heat and the... The AC comes on, right? How would you feel? You're going 65 miles an hour and you're trying, you don't know 
what it's going to do, right? You're hitting something and it does the opposite, right? Would you be afraid, right? I know I would be. Would you be angry, right? Which, you know what? I'm trading this car in ASAP, all right? This is a small example of how much you need your car's obedience in every single um, area to survive. Just survive to survive traveling, right? We want horses, we want ships, and we want cars, we want people all to obey us, yet we find it so difficult to obey God. Imagine how God feels when he puts his word in us to forgive, to love, to do all these things that he's put in his word, not to be bitter, not to, to, to have revenge, all these things, right? He gives us that, and we do the complete opposite, just like that car, right? You would be, you would be flabbergasted. You would want to trade that car in, right? How does God feel when He tells us to do X, Y, and Z? He tells us to work on this. He tells us to do that, and we do the ex exact opposite. He says, "Forgive your brother, your sister," and we go slashing ties. We go cuss them out. We go do all these things. It's a sin issue. It's a sin sickness. All right, that we have on the inside. There's an obedience issue. We find it so easy, and we find ourselves saying things like, man, I, I, I'm not there yet, man. You can forgive, but uh, you can forget, but uh, I, I'm not there. There's an obedience issue. When this is what he's instructed to be inside of us, and we find a way to malfunction, computer malfunction like that vehicle, and we do the exact opposite of what God has called to be on the inside of us. Wow. As verse number 10 says, my brethren, these things ought not be so. There's a virus, there's a sickness right, on the inside. How do we begin to repair this thing? I love this and I, I don't have enough time to go into all the things that James shares. But after this verse, he began to say, you know what? Hey, you got these things going on? Hey, Begin to do some of these things, all right? He says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Be humble. He says, submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh unto you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. Yes, he's talking to the people of God, all right? And purify your hearts. You double-minded. This is my operative verse. You double-minded. Man, we talked about those emotions in our mind. They want to do all these things. Double-minded means I want, like we said before, I want two different things. But I'm going to use a word that we used to use back in the day. It's hypocrisy or hypocrite, right? I'm double-minded, right? Today, I'm worshiping God, and tomorrow my emotions get the best of me, and now I'm, I'm cussing out everybody that I know. And see, if somebody's looking on the outside, looking in, like, man, they are hypocrites. And for one thing, God, God, what God shared with me, we have to begin to deal with ourselves in that way. We won't deal with ourselves and correct what's broken unless we see ourselves in our hypocritical state. All right, God, I've been a hypocrite here. I've done this and done that, God. Make me single-minded with your word. Make me single-minded with your word. And back in the day, you remember that word hypocrite. Look, you wouldn't let nobody... Nobody called you a hypocrite, right? <laughs> no, 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 nobody would call me no hypocrite. But we got to call ourselves that in some areas of our life. We really want to be honest with ourselves. You know, God, you know, I'm good in this area. But in this area, I've been really hypocritical. God, help me. This is when we come to God. Help me in this area. Help me be more patient. Help me deliver me. Transform me. Make me better. And that. It's how we begin to cause our prayers not to be hindered. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you, God, that you hear our prayers. But God, also there are some places in our lives, even as the men, the women of God, the ministers, elders, whatever our position, God, there are still areas, God, that are hypocritical in our lives, Father. And we just pray even now, God, you would help us with those things, God. Help us to use this word to change, to transform us, God. Let your Holy Spirit begin to soothe those broken areas in our lives. God, we give this word to you, God, praying that you strengthen the body of Christ as a whole. We give you glory, we give you honor, and we give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, New Life, enjoy this time with you and can't wait till our next time. 
See you then. God bless.